Hey, I'm Demo with... Hey, I'm Demo with Doesn't Hold Up, the show where we look at movies and video games, both old and new. Today, we're taking a look at Ghostbusters Afterlife, the fourth film in the storied sci-fi comedy series. Directed by Jason Reitman, son of original Ghostbusters director Ivan Reitman, the film stars Paul Rudd, Carrie Coon, Finn Wolfhard, and McKenna Grace as they try to uncover the mystery of what's happening in a sleepy Oklahoma town. Let's start with spoiler-free impressions. I'll admit, I came into Ghostbusters Afterlife expecting something much worse than what we got, with just a 47 on Metacritic, which for reference is 13 points lower than Ghostbusters 2016. I was expecting pretty much a total dumpster fire or at least like one major element to be like really really bad to bring the whole movie down but neither of those things came into fruition this is a solid enough comedy action sci-fi film that i think general audiences will mostly enjoy the movie does have a number of issues namely with its tone certain story beats and some of the characters um which i'll get into when we get into spoilers but nothing really kills the movie or makes it a bad movie by any means. Fans of the original looking for a Ghostbusters 3 won't find it here, and they might dislike this movie more than others due to certain aspects, but for me, as someone who doesn't care too much about the original films, this movie gets a pass as its own thing. I think I'd give it maybe a 2.5 or a 3 out of 5. Now on to spoilers. First and foremost, this movie is pretty good comedically. The first one is remembered as one of the seminal comedies of the 1980s, and I think this one carries the torch fairly well. It's definitely a different type of humor, however. The original was exasperatingly dry. To our first and only customer. I'm gonna need to draw some petty cash. I should take her out to dinner. We don't wanna lose her. Uh, this magnificent feast here represents the last of the petty cash. Slow down. Chew your food. And this one has some of that to it, but there are other types of humor as well. It usually takes a lot to make me laugh, especially movies that build themselves as outright comedies, but I was actually laughing pretty thoroughly throughout this entire film. There are a couple of groaners here there, but I was laughing and the audience I saw it with was having a blast as well. Compared to Ghostbusters 2016, that's a big win for this movie. One of my biggest issues with Afterlife is its story. Following the Force Awakens style of rebooting a series that has become all too common now, the movie was too afraid to move on from its source material. While we have a drastically different setting, the movie follows the original's plot beats very closely, especially its third act. And while The Force Awakens had a Death Star and had a Galactic Empire and had a Darth Vader, essentially, it at least called those things something different. With this movie, and especially with, you know, how the third act goes, it's just the same exact thing as the first movie, like frustratingly so. The movie literally just digs up the same monsters and enemies from the original film, and it is baffling. Gozer is back. The terror dogs are back. We get living marshmallows. Uh, these guys are I absolutely adorable. I love these so much. I, I know. love them in the movie. We, got our, and, uh, and our... we get a very Slimer-esque character named Muncher. There's a montage of the town being overrun by monsters that's exactly the same as the first film. There are just tons of lines and other minor callbacks to the original Ghostbusters that I guess some people might find fun, but there were a lot of them. Do it a couple times, it's fine, but any more than that, it gets grating. I get that people like seeing things that they know and it's much easier than writing an entirely original script, but I can't treat it as anything other than a pretty big detriment. Um, this giant lack of creativity where sequels, especially soft reboots, just take elements from the original films in place of original ideas. That's right, this is who we're making the movie for. Right. There's a relationship with this iconography. People love this car. 35 yeah. years later, people are still walking up wanting to take a photo of this car. We have to make a movie that's gonna make them happy. I hope that audiences eventually catch on and get sick of it, um, but it doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon, unfortunately. I like the characters for the most part, especially Phoebe. I think she works incredibly well as a young Peter Venkman, and I wish she was just the sole lead of the film. I'm going to be a little cynical here and think that maybe the producers or whoever just didn't think that general audiences would connect to a 12-year-old girl as the lead of their Ghostbusters film, which would be about as stark of a contrast as you can get to the original movie, but I think she carried the movie very well. Like, she was definitely the best character by far. On that note, I feel as though Trevor, played by Finn Wolfhard, was completely pointless, and his character overall made the movie worse. He basically didn't do 
anything in the movie, and his storyline and his interactions with other characters contributed almost nothing to the narrative. Speaking cynically, again, I think that from a marketing perspective, his name, his face, and frankly his gender look better on a marquee than if the movie was focused solely on Phoebe's character, but ultimately it made the movie worse. If I were to have had complete creative control, I'd have made Phoebe, as written, to be the sole lead, cut Trevor completely out of the film entirely, and use all of that space in the film's runtime to give Paul Rudd and Carrie Coon's characters more to do. They were somewhat interesting themselves, but I would have liked to have seen more. I also found Podcast to be a fun character too. You know, comic relief characters like that are often grating and hard to get right, but I found him to be solid enough. I mean, the strangest thing about Logan Kim was the amount of confidence he showed up on set with. Uh, there were actors in this film that had done plenty of movies, but being in Ghostbusters was intimidating. Logan Kim showed up like it was his 40th movie. <laughs> Carrie Coon's character is interesting because she's kind of a terrible mom, and I'm not sure if that's intended in the script or if Jason Reitman has a weird perception on what makes a good mom. She's negligent, possibly an alcoholic, can't hold down an apartment, and the movie kind of wants you to sympathize with her, but I found that hard given her flaws. Again, I'm not sure if I'm missing something or if Jason Reitman, the libertarian that he is, just has a different perception on what makes a good person, but... I mean, the lead kids only have one parent and Phoebe is kind of a genius, so I don't know. Speaking of that, and I'm going to get just a tad political here. In my review of the original Ghostbusters film, which you can read at doesitholdup.com, I noticed that the movie was kind of outwardly economically right wing thematically. Personally, I like the university. They gave us money and facilities. We didn't have to produce anything. You've never been out of college. You don't know what it's like out there. I've worked in the private sector. They expect results. And interestingly, this movie plays with that too, albeit much less. Early on in the film, the movie makes a point to disparage public schools, which I found kind of shocking. Like, I was waiting for it to have a point or a punchline, but no, it's really just saying public schools are bad. The original Ghostbusters film actually did the exact same thing. It very much disparaged public education in favor of running a business or capitalism or whatever. On top of that, Ray Stance, played by Dan Aykroyd, talks longingly about Ronald Reagan, which... Yeesh. Last night I tell you to watch that thing on television and I did. Yeah. To see those those monkeys from those African countries. Damn them, they're still uncomfortable wearing shoes. <laughs> uh Winston is now a millionaire or billionaire or something and mentions how he started his business with one employee or something to that effect. Very pro capitalist, very economically right wing libertarian and there's some other libertarian-esque stuff in the movie that kept coming up that I won't even bother mentioning, but I think 99% of people won't notice or care, so I can't really say it detracted much from the movie. I just thought it was all kind of interesting and relatively uncommon in movies these days. It's kind of funny how everyone was saying Ghostbusters 2016 was like super SJW or left-wing or whatever, where this one is the opposite. There was some typical egregious Sony product placement. It's not quite Dunkachino level, but the fact that we get a two minute Walmart ad partway through the film is annoying to say the least. That's another thing that I don't think most people will notice or care about, and I'm not against product placement in principle by any means, but it needs to be tactfully done to not be annoying. That wasn't the case in this film, especially the Walmart ad. I mean, they literally put the Walmart ad in the trailer. Did Walmart finance this entire film? Like, if Walmart is going to get such a giant ad partway through your film, they better be financing, like, half the freaking budget. Like, it is disgusting. Anyway, I'd like to talk to you about the sponsor of today's episode, Walmart. Do you like finding all of your household... Sorry. Do you like finding all of your favorite household goods at competitive prices? Shop at Walmart. Do you like contributing to the death of civilization? Check out walmart.com to learn more. Once again, I'd like to thank Walmart for sponsoring this portion of today's episode. Anyway, where was I? Let's talk about the bizarre ending. Up until this point, some issues aside, I was pretty much with the movie, but the fact that it decided to do just the exact same ending as the original film is a completely baffling choice. Also, as expected, we get to see the original Ghostbusters. I thought a scene like this would come off as completely embarrassing, but I think it kind of worked. They felt like those characters and they didn't miss a beat and I thought it was an actually kind of fun sequence, even though a lot of it just felt like the movie done again, beat for beat. I don't go a day in my life without seeing a person wearing a Ghostbusters t-shirt. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, a, it's a franchise that lives somewhere in everyone's heart. It means something different to every individual person, 
but they all love it. They all carry it. I'm not entirely sure how I feel about the ghost of Harold Ramis being in it. I think the idea of bringing back dead actors as CGI characters is a weird, creepy, slippery slope that my gut is warning me against doing. Like, so this is this is the, the actual archeological document. Just casually here in a thin glass case with a cheap <laughs> key. But I think it was handled in a somewhat tactful way in this film. Your mileage may vary on whether you think this is an appropriate thing to do in general, but if his character was dead and Harold Ramis was still alive, this was a somewhat sweet send off to his character. Oh, his character. I forgot to mention none of the characters had satisfying arcs, even Phoebe. There's kind of some man of science, man of faith type stuff going on with our character early on, but it doesn't really go anywhere. Somewhat of an issue. Anyway. After they take down Gozer and hug Egon, the camera pans up and we see the words for Harold appear on screen. And then the movie cuts to New York for some reason and we see the Ecto-1 driving into Manhattan and that's how it ends. No real epilogue for our characters where we get to see how these events shape them and potentially where their story will go from here. We sort of get that in the post credit scenes, but they're kind of weird because it feels like the movie is trying to imply that the original Ghostbusters are going to be the Ghostbusters from here on out, which would be bizarre, but it would make a little sense because I really don't see what you can do with the characters that we have. Phoebe, podcast Trevor, and Trevor's girlfriend are all kids, and the movie doesn't really set up Paul Rudd or Carrie Coon's characters to become Ghostbusters or anything. The movie kind of works because they're sort of just discovering the stuff on a whim, but to make them the Ghostbusters in a sequel, it would be kind of weird. Just a very weird ending for a million different reasons. And I know I've criticized the movie more than I've praised it, but all in all, it's a solid sci-fi comedy that up until the third act works pretty well. I thought that the comedy elements worked very well and that the characters and story up until the bizarre third act were engaging enough. I noticed some tonal inconsistencies and some character issues, but I think that they, as well as the egregious product placement and the bizarre third act will be largely forgiven by most viewers. It's not a great movie and it's not a particularly good Ghostbusters movie if you're looking for something in a similar style to the original film, but it's more than watchable and not a horrific failure like the 2016 outing. If you're concerned about COVID or live in an area that frowns upon sensible things like masks and vaccines, you can maybe skip it in the theater and wait for it to pop up on Netflix or whatever. But again, more than watchable, solid enough action comedy film. Hey, anybody see a ghost? That's it for this week. Hope you enjoyed the review. Let me know in the comments what you thought of Ghostbusters Afterlife and be sure to subscribe to never miss a video. For more content, visit doesitholdup.com. Thanks for watching.